Topo Athletic is committed to lifelong health and better movement. Topo builds running shoes for those who get out there every day regardless of weather, speed, energy, or mood. Their distinctive fit and feel combines instinctive human movement with modern performance and lightweight comfort to help you keep going, keep trying, and keep moving. Discover the Topo difference and step into a run experience unlike any other. Thursday, we just put the winners in a randomizer and you're about to find out who that is. And great timing, Michelle. Thanks for joining me. Hi, thank you. Uh, super excited to have you. And just like with any other guest, uh, we know that people are typically very humble in presenting themselves. So I'm going to give you a hype up intro that you've already heard in the green room, full transparency. <laughs> uh, um, but I know you're excited to hear it again. So here we go. All right. And full transparency with the notepad too. Not, I'm not shying away from that either. Uh, all right, get ready to be inspired. My next guest is endurance coach Michelle Simmons. Diagnosed with cancer at 25, Michelle turned her health crisis into a mission, helping others find their inner athlete. This superstar coach empowers women to push their limits. She's an 18-time Ironman finisher, four-time world championship in Kona, and she has been coaching for 15 years. Please welcome the amazing Michelle Simmons. <laughs> Thank you. Did my best. How'd I do? Oh, that, that was good. Yeah, you nailed it. Appreciate that. Um, so, Michelle, people have been waiting for this one ever since I put that post out on Monday, and you've been hyping it up yourself um, that you're going to settle this ongoing battle between me and Jason about pineapple on pizza. <laughs> so, I'm going to ask you now, Michelle Simmons, pineapple on pizza, yay or nay? Yay. Yes. <laughs> I knew and, I, it. and here's the thing, what we need to know is that I live here in Hawaii, which is, you know, the Hawaiian pizza. This is where we put our, it's, um, yeah, like pineapple and ham or pineapple and bacon. That is, it's excellent on pizza. And um, yeah, it, it is my number one choice. What, what do you have to say to the people who just like dispel, they're just, just like pineapple does not belong on pizza. Like, what do you have to say to those people as somebody who's a firm believer in it? Open your mind. <laughs> Try something new. You might surprise yourself. I can't wait, wait till Jason hears that one when he's going back on the video. He's actually going to be happy that he just won because he would have left the chat anyways as a true New Yorker. So. Uh, well, Michelle, I'm going to dive right into it. I, I'm so excited to ask you all the questions I want to hear all the things about your amazing story. And I've been on like your Instagram and your socials and I've seen some of the stuff you've posted and I've really resonated with it. But I wanna start back from the beginning. You've been an endurance athlete pretty much your entire life. How did you get your start in endurance sports? Mm, it's a good question. Um, so I've been an athlete my whole life. Like since my mom put me in gymnastics when I was like four. And I, I can't say that I know where it came from, but. I've always wanted to, I've always wanted to work hard. I, I enjoy working hard. I enjoy pushing myself. I enjoy finding where the, my limits are. And that was like from the time that I was a kid. And so um, at some point in college, um, I graduated from Arizona State University where I was a springboard diver. And at the same time, I was swimming as well. I swam in high school and I started swimming with a master's program there and of course like I met a boy and he was like you're athletic let's get you a bike and I was like you're cute okay <laughs> I'll get a bike so I can, like, chase you around right it's, it's a standard of 20 somethings too um so yeah I got my start in triathlon I was like 20 or 21 um so it's been a real my first triathlon was in 1995 and what's funny is that it's so I age myself some because I'm like back then when I tell people how I entered my first Ironman I'm like, you know what? Like there was no active.com. And like, I had a, we had to print out, we had to go to the website. First of all, like find out that there was an Iron Man because social media wasn't a thing. You know, active.com wasn't a thing. It was just this word of mouth. And I heard about some guy who like went to New Zealand to do an Iron Man. And I'm like, what's an Iron Man? That, you know, like, oh my gosh, that's crazy. And um, so, yeah, you know, like it was, it was just that classic story of, you know, we're out in a bar and we're drinking and we're like, let's do an Ironman. And, you know, we decided to do Ironman Canada in 1997. 
and so we we had to print out the you know the entry form fill it out by pen put it in the envelope with a stamp you know mail it and hope that we got in and this is before you know because they didn't really sell out back then right because it wasn't like you know you have 24 hours to enter and then it's like no entry frenzy like that but yeah so um that's how I started. And when we started, we knew nothing, right? Pick a mistake. And I made it because, you know, there were no coaches. We didn't know. I mean, we didn't know anything about technology. I didn't have a Garmin. It was like, I don't know, how long can I swim? I mean, and I was a good swimmer at the time, but how long can I bike? And running was a whole new thing. <laughs> I was injured the whole time I was training because I didn't know what I was doing. I'm like, oh, I'm fit enough. I could go run 10 miles. I'm like, well, my heart could take it because I was a swimmer, but my knees couldn't take it because I hadn't put the time in to do the pounding. So, um, yeah, I've been doing it. And then from then I've been just, I mean, yeah, I, this, this year might be the first year. Well, other than maybe some time in COVID where I didn't actually do a triathlon since 1995. Wow. Just, yeah, the consistency of years and decades, I guess. That's, that's amazing. That is, uh, impressive longevity of just like, you were like the definition of like consistency and perseverance and that is just really cool um and one thing i do have to add is that we had another guest uh diane b who has been trail running since 1993 so i have to ask you this question have you ever had to fax an entry before <laughs> i don't think i faxed one but i definitely mailed them like snail mail and i have you would laugh because i could probably get it out right now i'd have to do a little digging but in my file cabinet like back in those days, they would mail us the results, right? They would print out the results. So it'd be, you know, 10 days later, you'd get an envelope from the race director with the printed out results because they weren't online. And then that's, and I would study them. I kept them in a folder. <laughs> and I think I still have some of my drive on results from 1995, which is just be a total trip to get out and look at that folder. <laughs> oh, man, that's incredible. I would frame those. <laughs> Uh, so the next question, the next topic I want to dive into, and this is one of your pin posts on your social media. It's a big part of your story. I want you to take me back to Cinco de Mayo 24 years ago. You were just 25 years old. You were diagnosed with Hodgkin, Hodgkin's lymphoma. You were young and healthy. Uh, how did you react? Like what was going through your mind when you got that diagnosis? No, there, well, there's a whole story here, right? Cause like, so I was living in Arizona at the time. Um, I, I woke up one morning to just a chain of lymph nodes, um, around my collarbone. There were like three of them that were pretty swollen and they didn't hurt, but I couldn't like to turn my head was just really stiff cause it was all inflamed. And this is the week before the wildflower triathlon that was like usually early May, like May 1st or something was the triathlon. So end of April, I wake up with this chain of lymph nodes and I'm like, well, I'm going to this race. <laughs> like and and I managed to get in to see a doc and he he looked at me and and he said something like oh you know you might have mono and I was like oh doc I can't have mono you do not understand like I have three half Ironmans and a full Ironman on my schedule this summer like I don't have time to have mono and he looked at me and he said no you don't understand if you have mono we jump up and down and clap our hands and I was like I I don't know why because if if I were to experience that situation now, I would probe and ask the doctor more questions. <laughs> but as a 25 year old, I didn't probe and ask the doctor any more questions. I just thought he was a jerk. And I turned around and I walked out and I got in my car and I packed my bike and I drove to California to do this half Ironman triathlon. So um, I did the race. And what's funny is that, you know how critical we are of ourselves? Like, so, you know, you go and you do the race and in the moment you're like, that sucks. You know, like that wasn't like, like, I didn't have an extra gear and I was mad at myself. And looking back now, I'm like, oh my God, I did amazing in that race. Like I had cancer <laughs> like while I did that race and looking back and like knowing, you know, the whole picture and knowing what I know now, it's like, wow, I actually did really well. But um, I, my mom knew me really well at the time. And um, she was way more concerned about the lumps than I was. And so like, I have to give a shout out to my mom um, for her sense of urgency in getting this diagnosed. Basically she was like, um, she knew some doctors at the Cleveland clinic and she was like, you're coming home. It's mother's day anyway. So I bought you a plane ticket and you're coming home to Cleveland. Um, that's where I grew up was in Ohio. And she said, um, 
we have some appointments set up and we'll just figure this out, you know, and just think of it as a Mother's Day gift for me that you're coming home, you know, this weekend. Cause I was mad. I'm like, I have work. I have like, what do you mean? Like, I can't just get on a plane and go home, you know, but had it not been for that, I'm sure I would have ignored it for as long as I could have. Right. And just let it continue to spread. So a couple of days later on Cinco de Mayo, um, yeah, the doctor diagnosed me with Hodgkin's lymphoma. And I was like, what's Hodgkin's lymphoma? And he said, it's a cancer of your lymphatic system. And I was like, okay, I didn't know I had a lymphatic system, doc. <laughs> you know, but like, what does this mean? <laughs> and uh, yeah, and it was interesting because that year I, you know, so the first thing I did was go for a run. You know, so everybody is like, you know, in shock that like, you know, this healthy 25 year old has cancer. And I'm like, yeah, I got my running shoes and I'm just going to go figure this out, you know, while I'm running. And um, yeah, I think I, I just, I was very naive and I decided like, I'm, I'm going to, I won't be your typical cancer patient, right? Like I'm superhuman and um, spoiler alert, like I'm not superhuman. Like those cancer treatments are legit. <laughs> like, they, they took me down, um, but only for, you know, six months or a year or so. I um, went through all those treatments. I went through chemo, like four months of chemotherapy, a month or so of radiation. Um, it wasn't pretty, but I got through it. And then just gradually started my return to health. And then, and, and interestingly, sort of tried to forget about it because I didn't want that to be, for probably 20 years, I didn't really talk about it very much because I didn't, I don't know why, but like, I, I didn't want that to be my story. And it, what, it was only really like when I heard somebody else was diagnosed with cancer that I could say to, like, I could look them right in the eye and go, I know. Like, I understand what you've gone through. And, I, and it might be because I feel like, I mean, so you've run ultra, so you know this. And like, I would say with Ironmans too, it's like trying to explain what an Ironman is like to somebody who's never done an Ironman is a fool's errand, right? Like, I mean, I can tell you all day long, like what it's like at mile 16, you know, of the Ironman marathon, but like, unless you've done one, you don't know what that feels like. And the same thing with like a hundred mile run, like until you've done a hundred mile run, you don't know what it feels like at mile 80. And so I felt like maybe it was a similar kind of thing with the cancer. It's like, if you've gone through it, I'm like, oh, we have lots to talk about, right? But if you haven't gone through it, like, I don't know, like you don't need to know about all the complications that go along with chemotherapy and radiation. And you know, like, I just, but, but, but I do appreciate the experience because of the connection then that allows me to have with other people who, find themselves in that situation, right? And like, they're scared. And I'm like, okay, well then I can at least be somewhat of a, I'm not call it a role model, but like an inspiration maybe that go like, it is possible. Like there's life after cancer, like the life during cancer sucks and there's no way around that. Like it just sucks. Um, but you persevere just like we persevere with everything that we do. Yeah, I love your perspective on that. And Thank you so much for sharing all that. I really appreciate that. And I know that there are people who are watching this that are gonna benefit from that, whether it's they're watching it live or they're gonna watch it later. There are people that are gonna benefit from it, like you said. Um, so one of the things you mentioned on that post is talking about having a newfound obsession with health. Uh, talk about how your experience Experience shifted your perspective on what a healthy lifestyle is. Yeah, so that's a good point. Um, and it is, my perspective on health has really shifted like over, you know, 25 years. Um, and this is such a broad topic. I'm like, oh my gosh, where do I start? You know, health starts with our lifestyle, right? It starts with how we're thinking, how we're fueling ourselves how we're moving our bodies, how we're sleeping. Like those are the four major pillars. That, and when I'm teaching people with like a holistic, cause I, I teach this now like in a structured way. And when I'm teaching it, it's about those four pillars, right? So like your mindset, your sleep, your nutrition and your movement habits. And I think that since I'm talking to endurance athletes, I'm assuming like the majority of the audience here, you know, is endurance athletes and I have been there, you know, there's a thinking that like, oh, well, I'm exercising so much. And so that's healthy. And I, I would argue that like, it's absolutely possible to take that 
way too far, right? That like we can, we can push too much volume too fast. We can push too much intensity too frequently. And um, either of those things, or like just either ramping too hard or not allowing yourself to rest, like there's ways that our endurance training can wreak havoc on our physiology, like on our systems where our cortisol is high, our insulin might be elevated, you know, for longer than it should be. And when we're not aware of those things and you just have this, this mindset that um, training is healthy. And so like, and so I'm just going to train more and I'll be healthy. Um, it's, it's not true, <laughs> you know? And so th there's a sweet spot in there of like, what is um, like, if we're going for optimal health, I'm not sure that layering performance driven metrics on top of that is the way to optimal health. And so when we're balancing out, you know, like, and you say, so when I'm working with an athlete, it'll be like, all right, what's your, what are your goals? Why are they important to you? And then like trying to, to mesh what their lifestyle is with like, how long is it going to take us to achieve that goal? Right. Cause like, like I can take an athlete and turn their fitness around in six or eight weeks if I wanted, right? Just like you just pile on the intensity and you're going to see huge gains. And then what's going to happen? You're going to plateau out and your, your sleep is going to be crap. And, you know, you're going to be probably eating just all sorts of crappy food because you're starving all the time and, you know, your blood sugar's then on this roller coaster. You know, so it's like um, I, I'm taking all those things into consideration when, when training myself and when training athletes now that i have this understanding of like what we're doing to our bodies when we're training and that um more isn't necessarily better all the time and it depends right <laughs> so it's like it's it's all those things where i'm feeling like okay how do we have our good performances like health has to be at the base of it if you've overtrained yourself to the point where you're not responding to training anymore then like you have to back off and that's the part that's hard and mentally that's hard for athletes too because i mean and, and i can speak with authority on this because i've been that athlete that was completely addicted to the hard training right and like how do i feel good well i feel good when i go out and blast myself on a bike ride or i blast myself on a run and now that i look back and go okay what was i actually doing when i was doing that like well i was numbing myself from having to think about whatever the thing was I didn't want to think about is <laughs> if I just go run 18 miles and do it like pretty hard I'll come home and be so tired that all I want to do is put my feet up and not worry about that other thing and meanwhile I, I'm setting off this cascade of hormonal events in my body that is not serving me tomorrow so now I'm like I'm way Way more careful with intensity and volume than I used to be with myself and um, with athletes. And we're, and we're finding a lot of success. And it's, it's really cool. So you're like, oh, wait. So like if I'm happy and I'm healthy because I'm not overtrained and in the gutter all the time and I'm eating well and I'm sleeping well and I am involved in my community and I train appropriately, which is a lot easier most of the time, and then sometimes go out and push it like on purpose. So when I'm out pushing, I'm doing that on purpose. And if I'm not pushing on purpose, maybe twice a week I do that. The other times I'm just out moving my body in an easy way, lowering stress hormones, not raising them. And so just being aware of, you know, what are we actually doing with our bodies when we're training? I feel like that's something that a lot of people don't really know or understand to the extent that, um, or at least the addicted long distance endurance athlete athlete that that's who I'm talking to right there <laughs> and I, I you you would uh, uh you would be talking to me even just mm -hmm. like a year and a half ago so yeah uh, I mean intention is everything with when you're doing these things and I do think that like uh more is not necessarily better so thank you so much for sharing that mm -hmm. we have a lot of beginner athletes uh in our audience and I think that a lot of people go in not knowing that, and that is something that needs to be shared like gospel all the time. Yeah, yeah, and faster is not better. And so you're thinking yeah. like, what am I actually trying to train with this easy run, right? And so like, if you're staring at pace on your easy run, you're doing it wrong. 
<laughs> because like we're not i mean i almost would go as far as say like you're not even training running on your easy runs like you're just training your system you know like you're training your system to be durable you're training your system to be metabolically flexible you're training your mind to just keep going you know and just relax like it's not about pace on the easy runs but then like but it is important so it's kind of like then don't misinterpret that and think that all i'm ever going to do is go out and go as easy as i can like well if you want to get faster sometimes then you work hard and it's so true that the the number one mistake that it's a mistake that i made for a decade at least um and and it wasn't my coach's fault necessarily at the time right but the coach would say go easy and i would go out and i would run a pace that I, in my brain, I calculated as easy because it wasn't my fastest pace. And, uh, you know, so if you look at heart rate, you're like, well, my heart rate was 160. <laughs> like that doesn't count then as an easy run, you know, when your heart rate's 160, it doesn't go in that category. But, you know, if the pace is slow enough, then I called it easy, you know, and then, then you're wondering like, why am I not improving? Yeah. Uh, one of the, uh, one of my favorite sayings that I've seen is that uh zones are an effort they're not a pace yeah yeah fully and and actually i would even go beyond effort like to distinguish the effort in your brain because this is a big issue right like and there's somebody said it like a, another coach that that i was talking to and it was a really good way to put it and it was like your easy meter is broken <laughs> Right. So like, cause we have our meter where we're like, this is what I call easy. And so what my brain calls easy. And then it's like, is my body calling that easy or is it just my brain calling it easy? And like, so that's why, you know, if you're going to measure something, you're going to measure, um, your, your heart rate or at least your breathing. Like, so if you're not, if you don't like gadgets, fine. Like I, I train a lot on feel now. I will say that I used all the data to help me hone in my feel. Right. So like put the heart rate monitor on and go like, oh, it has to stay under this heart rate and that's easy for my body. And then like once my brain and my body were on the same page about what is easy and then also like what is hard, right? And like the better you get at the easy stuff, like spoiler alert, the better you get at the hard stuff and you'll recover from it faster. Like you'll nail it better. You recover from it faster. Everything is better when you get really good at the easy stuff. So that took me a long time to learn. And the hard stuff is really hard and you don't look forward to it if you take all your easy workouts and make them moderate, right? Then, yeah. And you're just like too hard or you're too tired to then go hard on the day. And they're like, I didn't feel like doing it. I didn't want to. I'm like, I guess what? If you go easy enough, often enough, by the time your hard key day comes around, you're like chomping at the bit. Like, I can't wait to go hit that. Right, because I've been bored out of my mind, like doing all this easy stuff. And like today, no leash, I get to go play. And then you're like looking forward to it. If you have a mindset like that, your training is adequately polarized. Like if you get to your hard day and you're like dragging ass and you're like, oh my God, like I can't, I don't know how I'm gonna do these, Get how am I gonna get through these intervals? Then like there's something off, right? And it's either that you're, you, your easy training is too strong or the other aspect of health that we were talking about. How have you been feeling yourself? How have you been sleeping? How are your relationships? What are your, you know, what's your mindset? Like all those things play in to this dance that we do, you know, with training. Uh, so it's been a process learning all of that. I am, uh, well, first off, I want to give a shout out to community leader Adina for saying RPE for life, um, because there are days where I absolutely do agree with that. I love rate of perceived exertion. I don't always love wearing my heart rate monitor. Um, I'm glad you brought up mindset and you talked about it as one of the pillars of health. And this is something we talked about in the green room. Talk about uh, how your relationship with mindset has changed, especially in the last two, three years and how you view it now versus how you used to view it then. Yeah, so um, it's interesting because I used to be like, just super hardcore and like it's all about training and it doesn't matter what your mindset is and you can't imagine your way to a Boston qualifying marathon time and you can't just positive think your way into hitting the pace on those run intervals like you have to actually go out and do it and I was steadfast in my thinking on those um, lines um, so I really I think what was happening is I was just misinterpreting like what can a positive mindset do for you Right. So like a positive mindset doesn't make me go out and run um, a, a magical PR 5K. 
right? Like I'm not going to just magically pull that out of my ass if I haven't trained for it. And that part remains true. What, what does change with the mindset is it affects like what we're telling ourselves. It affects the way that we feel and the way that we feel affects the way that we act, right? So if the actions, the actions are important in training, I need to train properly so that I can get to the race in a way that I'm, my, I'm physically ready to do it. And so if I wake up in the morning and the first thing I tell myself is like, oh, I have to do that thing and I have to deal with that guy at work and the, you know, just all, all the negativity, right? And it's like, are you even interested in getting out of bed when your first thoughts are about like all this negative stuff that I have to deal with? <laughs> you know, like the answer is no. And you might get stuck in that mindset I was in where it's like, I'm just going to go run off this dress <laughs> and, and deal with it that way, right? And screw the easy stuff. I'm just going to run harder, run away from my problems. Um, versus this mindset of if, to like adopt this mindset of positivity when you wake up in the morning you think what opportunities can i create today what can i practice getting better at today you know and it's like pick the thing i can practice being more aware of how i interact with strangers and like i'm going to today go out and smile and wave to strangers i'm going to be kind to people or um, i'm going to be really aware today or like i know i have something stressful um you know an event that that normally would cause me anxiety or angst. And I can think, think this is an opportunity for me to do that thing without getting all riled up. I'm gonna see how calm I can be in that situation where otherwise I would be an angry mess, <laughs> right? And so, when, and so when you approach, so it's like pick the thing in your life. It doesn't matter what it is. I'm afraid of that long ocean swim, great. This is an opportunity for you to show yourself that, you know, this is something that you can conquer. So then we like take our baby steps along the way. And so for me, I think the mindset is more a matter of like, when we recognize like a, a negativity, like the way that we're talking to ourselves or the way that we're viewing a situation. And then we assess, is the way I'm viewing this helpful for me right now? Or is it dragging me down? And if, if the way I'm viewing something is dragging me down because I'm thinking about it in a negative way, it is fully 100% in my control to find another way I can flip it and find another way to look at it. And, and it doesn't change the actual thing, right? Like if I'm afraid of ocean swimming, I can, I don't have to tell myself I'm not afraid. I can accept that like, oh, I'm feeling some fear or anxiety around this thing that I'm about to do. And so instead of squashing that down, I accept, okay, that's how I'm feeling. That's interesting. Okay, what can I do with that? Well, this is an opportunity for me to show myself that I'm stronger than I thought, or even though I'm afraid, I can go do the thing anyway. And then how do I feel about myself when I do that thing? And so it's a matter of recognizing ourselves for the things that we're doing well. Like, what am I doing right? And then when I recognize myself for that thing, I can then like boost my own self-esteem and my self-confidence and say, oh, okay, like I did that. So what else can I do? And then, then the door starts opening up. Right. And then that's like, you could just start going down this path and go, oh yeah. Okay. I can do that too. Um, it matters how we're talking to ourselves. And so being mindfully aware of the voice in your head and what's it telling you. Right. And is it the voice? And I will say too, in some of the like the mindset certification courses that I've taken, a huge aha for me that was just, I mean, this was huge. Realizing that everyone else in the course had a similar negative voice. So like all that negative shit that you say to yourself and that I say to myself about how I'm not good enough and I don't belong here and I'm not gonna be able to do this well enough and that I get blah, 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 all the things. Everyone has that voice. <laughs> And for me, that was such an aha to go, oh my gosh, like everyone has that voice. It's not like, it's like part of the human condition to have that voice. And so then when you realize that, that like, oh, I'm not alone here. There's nothing wrong with me. Then it's like, all right, hang on. Now I have a choice. Like I can choose to listen to a different voice. I can hush that voice, 
right? I mean, do I belong here on this Instagram live, like talking to you about all this stuff? I mean, initially you could go like, who am I to do that? Who am I? I'm just Michelle Simmons. Like, I'm not like this famous name, blah, blah, blah. And then you go, you know what? No, I have a lot of like valuable things that I can share with people and that people might benefit from hearing. And so I go, I'm going to say yes. And I'm going to put myself in this situation. And then you like see what happens and it's, it's gratifying to do. And it's life becomes really fun when you look at it. Like it's this game that I get to, de- I get to choose and decide what do I want to do with myself and how do I want to do it with what mindset do I want to take with me on this journey? Right. Do I want to do it with a chip on my shoulder, trying to prove to everybody that I'm good enough or do I want to do it? like with this sense of joy of like gosh it's so beautiful out here these trails are incredible and this community is so nice and you know you know what i mean like they're like there's a way to enjoy that journey of this ultra versus if i don't go under 17 hours like you know i'm gonna okay. i suck <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, which way is more enjoyable which way is more you know is going to set you up for the, the long journey uh well First off, you are not just Michelle Simmons. You are, according, <laughs> according to my hype card, you are the amazing Michelle Simmons. So, <laughs> thank you. Um, second off, this is another thing that we talked about in the green room, and this is the last question I want to ask uh, before the rapid fire. Um, and it's a very important question, and it's something that we talked about extensively in the green room. Um, you've been doing this thing a long time. You've been in the sport a long time as a female coach as a female endurance athlete. Uh, what do you think has changed for the better? What do you think still needs to change? And what advice do you have for aspiring female athletes? Mm. Right, so things that have changed for the better is that we know so much more about how to train properly and in a healthy way to set us up for success than we did before. So like two decades ago, we really had no idea. We were all running blind, or at least most of us in the amateur world were clueless about how to feel ourselves and how to pace ourselves and how to build a progressive training program. So it's a like progress on, we know now how to do this in a good, fun, positive, healthy way. So like, that's awesome. I think a potential negative comes along with so back in i will call them like the olden days <laughs> like when triathlon was new you know results were not up live on the internet as you were doing the thing right like you could just go out and race and just do the best you could and you didn't have to worry about um what does everyone think about what i'm doing right now like right and like so that voice in our head is am i good enough you know, is she judging me because I didn't go as fast as I wanted to, or like that girl beat me or like just the, the negativity that can happen when we get too overly competitive with ourselves. Um, when we race with a chip on our shoulder, I think that all that needs to go away. And really, and, and I used to think that, you know, if I wasn't hard, hard on myself, how was I going to get results? Right. And like, that's a way to look at it like I can't just go easy on myself so like I so don't misunderstand what I'm saying because I'm not saying like oh just go easy on yourself and don't worry about it it's not that there's a sweet spot in there that's like I can give my best and be kind to myself right I can I can train as hard as I can and I'm a good person if I don't race as fast as I ever did before Right, like that, like my race uh, results are not, um, they don't reflect who I am as a person. And so like, there are still some people I think who need to, who would benefit from um, following that path, right? Of the, and that's where the mindset stuff comes in, where you say like, what, why are you doing this? And if you're doing it, cause like, I'd love to be part of my community and this is so much fun and I enjoy pushing myself and I just wanna see how fast I can go great right if it's like i have to beat this time that i did you know 10 years ago or else blah 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 you know and you're like well you know like ultimately that's probably not the path that's going to put you um it 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 won't even result in the best results like 
watch some of the best professionals in the world and they're out there, they love what they're doing and they're, they can do two things at once. They can focus and love it. So it's not an either or. And, and so when I tell athletes like, you know, go have fun with that race today or tomorrow, whenever it is, I'm not saying be frivolous and bounce around and don't try because guess what? Trying your best is fun. So it's like, that's the, um, that's the avenue that I think that the path to longevity, if you want to do this for a long time, bring on that mindset, you'll still reach PRs. I love you'll just, that. Just do it in a way that you're really enjoying it. I love that so much. And thank you so much for sharing that because again, it's something that beginner athletes definitely need to know. And I think even some of us who've been doing this for a longer time need to need to know as well and sometimes need to get to the point where they have to reassess and realize that these are things that matter um well before we jump into the rapid fire i wanted to open up the floor to you to kind of just like let everybody know where they can follow your journey mm. I, I post most often um right here on instagram so it's the mama underscore simmons underscore um, here on instagram occasionally i paste i post stuff on um facebook or twitter but like, I don't know, mostly it's here. And then I also, my, the team of triathletes that I coach is, is called Team BSC and it's at Team BSC Try on Instagram. And so I, on that page, I post more of like the stuff that my athletes are doing, right? Like their successes and their things go up on the Team BSC page. And then my personal stuff is more on Mama Simmons. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, are you ready for the rapid fire, Michelle? Sure. Hit me. Oh. I don't even know if I'm ready for a rapid fire. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Donut truck or ice cream truck? Ice cream. Love that. What flavor of ice cream? Chocolate. Love it. Uh, um, nut butter, crunchy or creamy? Crunchy. <laughs> like, oh, I'm going to fast on this, right? <laughs> Dude, I'm team crunchy too. I love it. Candy corn, yay or nay? Um, okay, so it depends. Can I do a depends in a rapid fire? Yes. Okay, so um, if you're um, in the middle of a Zwift race, yes. Otherwise, no. That's a bear. <laughs> I think I <laughs> no all the time because <laughs> it's. <laughs> if I need sugar, like this would be the thing. Like there's times where, like you know, when you're working out, like at your threshold or near your threshold, and your body needs sugar, I will accept sugar in any form. Oh, but man. outside of that situation, that's where I would say no to the candy corn. I just think there's so many better forms. <laughs> <laughs> there are, but guess what? If that's all you had, I would eat it. It wouldn't no, be my fair. number one choice. But like, if I had to eat it and I needed fuel, I would eat it because. Yeah, my body needs sugar. I will give it sugar in whatever form I can find. I respect that answer. Uh, peeps, yay or nay? Mm, no. When I was 10, yes, but not anymore. <laughs> uh, when I was absolutely never. <laughs> uh, favorite candy bar? Reese's. Does that count as a candy bar, Reese's Cups? So, I mean, I'll take it. Maybe those. candy. Is or Snickers. Question. Snickers too. I like Snickers bars. Uh, red velvet. Is it a real flavor or is it chocolate with red food dye? No, it's red, red dye for sure. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and are you a fan of licorice? No. no, I don't like it at all. All right. Skipping that one. Apple cider or pumpkin spice? Apple cider. Hmm. Totally. I'm totally a pumpkin spice guy, but Jason's an apple cider guy. Just mm. another three on. <laughs> So, so when he's mad at me about the pineapple thing, you could be like, but she likes yeah. apple. Apple <laughs> cider. Uh, uh, now, a couple more questions, not food related, more training related. When you're training, music, podcast, or nothing at all? Mm, um, podcast when I'm going easy and music when I'm going hard. Love that. Um, your most recent and favorite mantra? Mm, I am my opportunity. Oh, I love it. Now, these are great answers. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle, thank you so much for joining me on this fireside chat. Um, it's been exciting having you on. And this has just been a great, honestly, an eye opening conversation for me, just stuff that I've kind of learned along the way, but like being able to hear it from someone's perspective of someone who's been doing this a long time and has gotten a lot of wisdom is 
it was truly an honor to talk to you. So I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, thanks. No, I really, I appreciate it as well. So thank you. I hope you have a great rest of your evening. All right, thanks.